Hello and welcome to One to Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And my name is Chris Casey and I didn't study or work in either of those things. (laughs) Each week Hallie tells us something that we don't know. This week, plant taxonomy. (laughs) Is that your spooky voice? So, for those of y'all that don't know, um, I auditioned for a couple of uh, audio dramas. And Yay! one of my characters has a moment where he has to do sort of a, a movie a movie producer or a movie um, a movie guy voice. Mm. And that was, my, that was my movie guy voice for my character. That was pretty good. Yeah, that pretty that's, good. that's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> no, I like it. I really do. So, I got to say, for the first, I don't know, month or so, when I saw this on our schedule, Mm -hmm. um, it was just abbreviated plant tax, and I thought we were going to talk about taxes on plants. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Nope, we're talking about plant taxonomy is the full word. Oh boy! So how they're how they're named, how they're classified, how they're divided up into category, category, categories. Yes, categories. Don't make it more complicated than it is, Dad. Um. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the whole circle tree of life thing. That's pretty ding dang complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So taxonomy is basically how we categorize living things. There's also a term called phylogeny, which is is kind of a similar system, but is actually based on evolution and like genetic closeness. Um, and it's basically sorting living things by that. And taxonomy is slightly different because often things are not based on science, which we'll get into. What? I know. Can you believe it? I'm confused, and whenever you say something is not based on science, it hurts my heart a little bit. (laughs) Well, I mean, so the current system that we use for taxonomy was created several hundred years ago before basing things on science was particularly possible, so we more just, like, looked at a couple of plants and said, those look pretty similar. Right, right, right. right? Um, And now we're able to, like, actually, like you know, do genome testing and things like this, where we really get into how are they actually made? How did they evolve? So we're slowly moving things around in our current taxonomy. But a lot of how we categorize plants is much more based on phenotype and like how it looks and not necessarily based on the actual DNA of the plant. Okay, so hang on, let me let me make sure I'm keeping up. Uh, What is based on how it looks is the name specifically or actually how it's classified in some way so typically it's actually how it's classified we're slowly moving things around as we learn more about the actual genetics of plants and also all living things uh but but we don't really know for a lot of plants like we haven't done dna testing on a lot of plants so for a lot of them, they're just based on that they look similar, which is probably indicative that they're closely related, but is not always true. Wow. I just I just assumed that we were already there because um, we'd already done some uh, phylogeny, you called it, for mm-hmm. like bacteria and tiny things that are slightly larger than bacteria and other such animals. I mean, listen, there's a lot of plants. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of plants. <laughs> and we just can't we just can't do DNA testing on all of them. We can't like get the genomes of every plant. That would take way too long and also probably not be useful for the most part. I mean, I watched CSI. They do like at least one DNA test a week. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's pretty easy. Let's just get the guys at Hollywood to do it. There you go. Where did all this stuff start? Okay, yeah. So let's let's start at the beginning. So taxonomy is a system that humans use to understand the relationships between plants. And this has existed for a very, very long time in many, many different cultures and civilizations. Like, we have always needed to know stuff about plants. 
because we were growing it or we were foraging it or whatever it is. There was always some way to describe plants in relation to each other for the most part. A lot of those ways were not written down. Most of them were oral, so we don't have a lot of records for many of those categorization systems, but we do have some. So around 3000 BCE, Materia Medica, which originated in China, and focused a lot on medicinal plants. It didn't necessarily classify them, but it did talk about how plants interact with humans, and sometimes that plants were more closely related to other plants. And then around 1200 BCE, the Egyptians started classifying their medicinal plants. So they gave them like specific names based on the type and location. Okay, and so this is still location, but also just on, on how they look, not necessarily... I don't know what they do or anything. Yeah, yeah. So one right. example was like they had a plant called the celery of the delta and the celery of the valley. So these are two plants that we can still see today and they are closely related in our taxonomy. They look quite similar, but they just grow in different places and they're slightly different. Do you put it in soup? No, a different kind of celery. Okay. So then we move into the classical era, which was a big, a big time for taxonomy as it was a big time for a lot of different scientific practices. We start with the big dude Aristotle in like the 300s BCE. He was just super into like classifying everything. Aristotle the philosopher? Yeah. Is there nothing he can't do? Nothing he can't do. I, guess. I mean, probably some <laughs> stuff he can't do, but probably he just loved to classify stuff. So he just classified a bunch of different things, including plants. That's awesome. He wasn't great at it, but he did it. Okay. Was he considered great at it at the time? I mean, no one else was doing it, really. Okay. That's so not, yeah. in that sense, sure, I guess. But his student, Theophrastus, wrote a much more detailed classification system of plants. And it includes names that we still use today, like Narcissus, which is a kind of plant that we still call it the narcissus flower. Wow. That, yeah. That, that's some that's that's some enduring information right there. I know. Very enduring nomenclature. Um he only did like 500, but that's I mean that's a fair amount I was when you say, think about <laughs> If he was doing it on his own and given the uh the tools of the day, I mean, I don't know, tools of the day. We didn't have computers to do it, you know, until fairly recently, but figure he's using some sort of quill pen and and uh, vellum or or papyrus or maybe parchment. I don't know. I don't know much about paper technology of the <laughs> classical era, but um, you know, given given what he had available, and that's that's great. That's awesome. You you go, Theo. Yeah, I mean that would. I I'm sure it took a very very long time. When I was studying in India, I did a project that involved classifying plants, but I did not start off with very much information on the different plants in India. So a lot of what I did was like I would take a leaf or a fruit or something to someone who was also working at my organization and say, what do you call this in Hindi? And they would give me the Hindi name and then I would look up the Hindi name and then cross-reference that with the Chinese name because that is the book that I had available to me. Whoa. And then I would cross-reference the Chinese name with the English name and then I would get the Latin name. That's amazing. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that was, you know, in some way quicker than just starting from scratch. But I can tell you it does take a while to figure out how plants are different and to go out and find them all. I guess picking names probably took a while, but he did about 500. Not bad. Okay, so then we have Paulinus, who was still technically in the classical period, but a couple hundred years later and in Rome, not Greece. And he started to give plants Latin names. So before this, the names were in, you know, whatever people were speaking. Plinius happened to be speaking Latin, so he started giving things Latin names which kind of stuck. So he came up with like the name Populus Nigra, which means black cottonwood. And we still use that name. I had no idea the practice went back that far. Turns out, right? Wow. Yeah. So he started giving things Latin names, which which stuck around. Uh, we then had the Middle Ages, which no, no one was really doing much in Europe. Kind of, we just stagnated. We kind of like were left with Theophrastus and Linus's and also just like people's understanding of plants. We didn't really improve on it for a while until... Not a great time for a scientific advancement. Not really at all. We then got to like the 16th century. All right. Um, Coming along. There was this, yeah, there was this French guy whose name was Tournefort. 
And he wrote like the new standard. So he did like 6,000 plants. Whoa. Uh, yeah. He did a whole bunch of them and he just like named everything. He, the one thing, he did not believe that plants had sex. So... I don't really know what he thought was happening, but he didn't think it was sex. I mean, I guess he just thought they were growing. But I mean, I feel like this is a whole other episode. But when you say plants have sex. Uh huh. Like you they mean, sexually reproduce. Okay, so they're not like out there getting busy. They're like spouting out their uh, their pollen and getting on each other with that and making us sneeze and, and them all happy. Yeah, they get all up in it. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, having sex like sexually reproduce, meaning that one specimen that is genetically distinct from a separate specimen will share oh, okay, sexual yeah. organs and create right. a new genetically different specimen. I never even thought about it that way with plants. I mean, I just take it for granted with animals or mammals yeah. at least. But I never thought about it that way for plants. Yeah. I mean, it's it's important to to clarify that because there's a lot of ways that plants vegetatively reproduce. Like if you think about like how we grow potatoes, it's just you're just growing the same potato plant, but just like in different places. They're genetically identical because you just are basically using a clone. You just put it under the sink and out comes a sprout. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You You can just like clone that and then if you like have a potato plant you can cut it in half and it'll just keep growing it'll, it's genetically the exact same but it's like then two separate plants but i mean they do grow new genetically diverse different specimens via seeds so it's kind of important for us in botany and horticulture to distinguish that because they're like two very clear methods of reproduction sexual and asexual all right well now we've got the plant sex out of the way um <laughs> Moving along. Yeah, so this guy, Tournefort, he, I don't know if that's how you say the name. Honestly, guys, I don't speak any French. It's how it's spelled. But he did 6,000. It was huge. Everyone was like, wow, this is amazing. And, like, that was the new standard. And for, like, 100 years, everyone used his book until we had Linnaeus. And Linnaeus is, like, the main dude. He's, like, the big cheese in botanical history. And what was so special about Linnaeus? And where have I heard that name before? Probably from me being a nerd about botany. Okay, I'll accept that. Yeah. <laughs> so the big thing that Linnaeus did was before he got to the table, there were a lot of what's called phrase names, where things just had a name, and that was the name, and then you'd find a new plant, and you'd be like, this looks related, but it's going to have a different name. Like, even if plants were related, they would have separate names. So he came up with the idea of binomial naming, which we use throughout the entire all of taxonomy for all of life on Earth. So is this where we get into the whole genus and species thing? Exactly. You nailed it. Whoa, nice. Go me. So, and I mean, it took quite a while to get there. Yeah, it's it's not terribly intuitive if you're like trying to come up with a naming system, but it really makes a lot of sense and it makes it easier. So basically how this system works is, for example, like we are people, we are Homo sapiens before long time ago, there was another species called Homo erectus, which was very closely related to us. So they were in the same genus, but they were a different species, meaning that that second part, which is called the epithet, is different. In plants, we have a genus called Juglans. We have Juglans nigra and we have Juglans macrocarpa. So Juglans nigra is black walnut and Juglans macrocarpa is the little walnut. So it's kind of a way of just like translating that into Latin, but you put juglans up front so you know exactly what it is, and then you add the epithet at the end so you know what type of it it is. Nice. Do you know what kind of reception this got? I mean, like, who knew about plant taxonomy in the era of plant taxonomy? Was it confined to scientists, or uh, was it widely known, or what? That's a good question. It was mostly just used by scientists Oftentimes, if people were maybe herbalists or in, in some other way involved in plant propagation or use, they would use one of the taxonomies, but it was kind of regional on like what taxonomy was used. So like in France, they were all using tourniforts and like some other place they might be using a different one. I mean, I, I mentioned a couple of guys, but like there were a lot of other people involved who like wanted to get in involved in this and they came uh. up with a whole different system. So yeah, people were using it if they were practitioners. 
if they were like having to to use plants a lot or you know i mean there was also like botanical science throughout you know from like the 1500s onwards and then back in the classical era there are other people doing botanical science and they were also using these names but there really wasn't like a universal standard the way we have it now like now if you go anywhere in the world they all use latin names for their plants and they're all the same that was not the case like everyone had regional differences on which taxonomical system they were using yeah, I uh, I can sort of imagine this guy in the 1700s coming up with a system and then, you know, getting slow buy-in from the few people that use it. Whereas now, if someone somehow came up with some better taxonomical system, billions of people around the world would be going, oh, hell no, the way I know is just perfectly fine. Why do we got to go change and everything? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, it took a while for his system to catch on. Like he was not cool. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He was a big nerd. Yeah. (laughs) Imagine that. (laughs) I know. He was so he was like not from a rich family and he wasn't that well educated, but like his dad wanted him to get an education. So he sent him off to a boarding school. And at this boarding school, he just like wouldn't go to classes and would instead just go wander the fields looking at plants. (laughs) Uh, Sounds like the boy's got problems. I mean, (laughs) it worked out for him in the end, I guess. Indeed. But yeah, so he was just like wandering around looking at plants and the headmaster was like, you're not coming to classes. And he's like, I love plants. And he's like, "Okay." So he like gave him like a plot outside to do like gardening and experiment on different plants and stuff like that. Eventually, he went to university and he impressed a bunch of his professors and he started to like get expeditions to go out and like look at plants and classify plants and think about plants. But by all reports, he was a big nerd and like not that cool. And everyone was like, who's this weirdo who just loves plants so much? Hey, man, ner- nerds rule the world. I mean, it's true. It worked out. Yep. Uh, so so Linnaeus came up with the binomial naming system. He also like really solidified the idea that plants were sexually reproducing. He also came up with some more words that we still use today, which I think, I mean, had a lot to do with just how hard he was looking at plants. So he described things that just no one had thought to describe before. Like he cr- came up with the word Corolla, which is... Uh, like the Toyota? No. <laughs> I mean, that might be where they got the word. I don't know. But Corolla means uh, like the circle of petals. So if you think of like a magnolia, the Corolla is like all five of those magnolia petals. Or oh. six of those magnolia petals. So Today it's like I that, learned. The group. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also like came up with the word filament, which is like the, the skinny thing that the pollen sits on top of. It's part of the stamen. He came up with some of these different words that it's just like really small things that are now very helpful for us in describing the plants but yeah just no one had ever like gotten a name to before at least in english he probably didn't get royalties i'm almost certain that he did not he got a lot of other stuff though he was pretty well taken care of uh, well then i don't feel bad for him <laughs> all right so we have all these you know rules from from way back when do we use the same rules now i mean do we use the stuff that linnea came up with or do we have our own stuff or has it changed or stayed the same for 300 years or 2000 years or whatever it's i mean it's it's been fairly consistent since like the 30s uh so there was like this big conference which and the which 30s the 1930s oh, okay so fast forward a couple more hundred years and we have a conference yeah so there were like even though we had a binomial naming system in at the turn of the century there was still a lot of confusion around like which names were going with which plants so the europeans had like a conference to settle it and they were like these are the names for these plants these are the names for these plants and the americans did a similar thing so there were two systems for a while and then in 1935 they all got together and said okay let's rectify this we want the same system across the board so then the europeans and the americans had a system and that pretty much became the standard for scientific literature which then became the standard for the industry as well and so we've had that for about a hundred years or so yeah, a little less than. Yeah, I think it was 1935. Just a hair shy. Everyone's got to have a conference about everything. And now that species and genus are part of the public education system, we'll never be able to change it ever again. Which, I mean, it's it's working very well for us. Unless we have like a really major breakthrough that needs us to reimagine how we think plants function fundamentally or how they relate to each other fundamentally. I think that this is a pretty solid system. Well, I'm sure Linnaeus thought his system was a pretty solid system, and (laughs) I bet Aristotle was all about his way of doing things. Yeah, that's probably true. 
I mean, there there are some issues with it, but I think that we should get into those after the break. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the magical world of the break. Welcome to the middle part. So today we would love it if you would tell a friend. Tell a friend? Tell a friend. I think it was Catherine in the last episode talked about having podcast buddies. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really cool idea. So yeah, just share this with your podcast buddies. Yes. Maybe start a podcast group chat where you can all talk about your favorite podcast together. Oh, my brother and I talk about podcasts every once in a while. And it's a great it's a great family bonding moment. There you go. If you have siblings, perhaps you have estranged siblings who you never can bond with about anything. Maybe you send them a one to grow an episode. Maybe they fall in love with it and you guys can talk about it until the end of time. And your parting words on your deathbed are about one of our dope episodes. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe that's it. Or maybe just tell the person that's next to you at work. There you go. Another good option. It really means a lot to us if you really enjoy the show and you want to share it with someone else. That is, honest to goodness gracious, the very best way to help our show and help us grow and continue making this podcast. So if there's one episode that you liked or one person that you think would like the show, please Go ahead and tell a friend. That would be great. Thank you to Lindsay, our Starfruit patron. We love you and appreciate you. you. And we love you very much. Happy birthday. Oh, I didn't know her birthday was coming up. It's around the time this episode is released. Oh my gosh. Happiest of birthdays. Happy happiness. And with that, should we get back to the episode? Let's get back to the episode. Okay, Dad, you got a nature fact for us? Yeah, okay, so... Da-da-da-da-da-da, nature fact. No, that's for after the nature fact. You can't do the jingle the wrong time, Allie. Jeez. We've always put it before. No, I thought it was always after. <laughs> no, it always like before? every episode, it's always before, yeah. Oh, well, see, now I'm confused. Okay, we'll go back and double check before I edit it. Okay. So, uh, the subject of plant taxonomy, um, I don't know, I, mm-hmm. I googled it a little bit. And I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, and somehow I came across uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And I've actually heard of, of Lamarckian evolution, mm-hmm. which, I mean, I think we know now isn't, isn't really how things progressed. But he was the first person to draw a tree of life. Oh, wow. It was mostly parallel lines, starting with worms and going into more uh, complex animals. Um, but he was, uh, I think he did it in 1809 and he was the first person to sort of, uh, visualize the process and it's, you know, definitely improved upon, but, you know, I think of that big giant circle, um, mm. tree of life, which is so complex and it, I just thought it had a cool, humble beginning. Yeah, that's cool. And I like that because I really do feel like worms should be at the number one position. They do so much for us. Worms are dope. <laughs> and for those of you kids. Uh, old people like me, not in the know, dope means cool or good. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, now you do the the theme. Da, 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 da. Nature fact. Nature fact. I love the theme. It's my favorite theme <laughs> in the history of themes. Thanks very much. Thank you. So back to plant taxonomy and sure. all the good stuff. Um, mm-hmm. It was all good. No, it wasn't. I mean, I feel like every time... Yeah. Every dang time. It's like I get excited about this new concept that I'm learning about and something bad's got to happen because, you know, people were involved. Yeah, pretty much. It's I mean, I'd get used to it. I get comfortable here. All right. Uh, What did they do? if, If nothing else, then you're excited when there's not something bad at the end. Yeah. So plant taxonomy, there are a lot of benefits to having an organized scientific naming system. However, it has been used as a tool of colonialism and imperialism around the world, which sucks and has led to a lot of alternative, like other understandings, like scientific understandings of nature and of plants and how they relate to each other, just dying out or just being decimated to the point where we still have them around today, but they are slowly dying um, as older generations die so it's it's really sad it's not good it's very bad so people came in and they heard the natives give 
their names for things and they said what no you can't use your names anymore because our names are better yeah yeah they were basically like these are the names for them now and we're not using those indian names anymore or depending on wherever they were in the globe and whatever name they were using for the people who lived there it wasn't just names though it was also like an understanding of how plants relate to each other which is really like what taxonomy is it's like categorizing plants based on how we think they are related and you know like we said at the top of the show this this idea of plants being related ha- has always existed in many places and so there were many different understandings of nature and of plants and how they relate to each other that we're now losing or have lost which is not only like a huge cultural loss but is a loss for science because in order to have robust understanding of science and of nature we need many different perspectives and ideas and we're losing those okay so playing devil's advocate for just a second sure if you have like a better understanding of something shouldn't that replace an old understanding of something that's that's not as accurate i mean i i would kind of challenge the idea that that binomial taxonomy is better it is very useful in many ways but there are a lot of things that it does not cover a lot of failings in that system like it is human made we have a lot of issues with it which i will go on and you know talk about a lot of the issues it's not a perfect system i would not say that it is better than some of the traditional naming systems that indigenous people have been using for centuries Oh, that hurts my heart. I know. It's sad, right? It's really sad. I mean, not that it's not better, but just that, you know, we if knowledge has been lost, then and it it was truly good, valuable, useful knowledge. That's that's not a good thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, to put aside like all of the genocide that went along with that, the idea of loss of knowledge is, is I mean, it's gutting just globally, I think. Okay, let's bring it back to the happy place. For a minute. It is a useful tool though, right? Yes. So how is it useful? useful? Like how do we use it? Why is it a useful thing? So one way that we use it is just science, right? It is helpful that internationally scientists can discuss plants and be talking about the same thing. So like I can go to another country and ask about a plant and if they give me a binomial name then I'll be able to understand what they're saying. It's kind of like a universal language, kind of like math. You know, numbers are universal. Binomial names are universal. That's very helpful. We also use the categories as kind of a shorthand in the industry to understand how plants are related. So, like, we have plants in the citrus family, things like oranges and citrons and lemons and limes, all of these things we might be able to practically use that knowledge that they're closely related to breed them to make a hardier plant or to make a more delicious plant or to make something new. Uh, like that's how that's how we got lemons was we took two plants that were closely related and we bred them and we got lemons. So we, we use, I know, life did not give us lemons. <laughs> Yet we still made lemonade. We still made lemonade. Uh, yeah, I mean, we use we use families as like a shorthand to understand what plants we might be able to pull genetic material from or breed other plants with to, you know, make something more useful. We also use binomial naming in the horticulture industry a lot. So like if you're a florist and you need to order flowers, sometimes you'll use the Latin name. Sometimes you'll use the common name, but oftentimes you'll use the Latin name, and it's very useful from that standpoint. Okay. To a point. <laughs> to a point. There are some other issues with it. So... Oh, boy. I, I had a very revelatory experience when I was sitting in an ecology seminar, and this guest lecturer got up, and he brought up, like, this huge map of different species, and it had, like, different species and genuses and families and subfamilies. It was, like, this big map of all of these different organisms. And he just said, we made this up. This is just something we made up. No, wait. And that was so hard for me to understand because it's crazy to think because you spend years and years like memorizing names and learning families. Uh, but we made it up. Like okay. it has. But yeah. it, it isn't, isn't after a certain point or. Isn't everything we do, everything we name, every word we come up with, I mean, it's all made up? Yeah. Why Why is this more made up than, say, I don't know, the periodic table or, or something? Well, 
Okay, that's a good example. With the periodic table, you can like look at an element and you can say, here are the ways that this is quantitatively a different thing, right? Okay. With plants, that's a little bit harder because not only are we saying these are different things, we're also saying here's how they're different. And in nature, there's not like a line that says like, okay, here's where it goes from being a family to being a genus. Like we made that line up. And there are examples where scientists disagree that like there are plant, there are actual plants where they're saying like, no, this is the line for a family. And other people are saying like, no, that thing you're calling a family is actually a genus within a different family. We're, we're making this up. Like, this is a tool that is based on nothing but our observations of the natural world. Not not really much science beyond just us looking at stuff pretty hard. It's And there's, there's only so much we can look at because we've only been able to sequence a genome since, like, what, the 1990s? Like, the, two, the early 2000s? We, we do not have, you know, the DNA mapped of m- most plants. So a lot of what we're looking at is just like how the plants grow and what we think about it. And we're putting our like Eurocentric lens over these plants and saying this is this is how they're related. This is how they're functioning. Like this is how we're going to categorize them. But we're making that up. Will, will DNA sequencing uh, give us more answers or will it just make the arguing about these lines more complicated? So that's that's the question. So currently what is happening is as we sequence more plants and as we understand more about the evolutionary history of all these different plants, we are moving them. So things will move from genus to genus, sometimes from family to family. Like they will just pick a plant up and move it somewhere else because where it was originally was not scientifically founded and they're like oh we found better science it more accurately belongs over here and there are some benefits to that i think that there's huge scientific benefits i question the benefits for the industry of moving things around uh, because this has real effects on horticulturalists like i started learning botany and horticultural sciences about 10 years ago in that time Many of the scientific names I learned are not accurate anymore, are just outdated because things have been moved to a different genus um, or they've changed the epithet or something like that. So it becomes quite difficult because a lot of the names that I learned were names that I need to use if I were to like become a landscaper or to, you know, become a nursery manager. Okay. And in this case, the word epithet means... Oh, sorry. It's this. It's the second half of the binomial name. So the first half is the genus, and the second half is what's called the specific epithet. So like if we have Juglans nigra, Juglans is the genus, and nigra, meaning black, is that epithet. Okay. What's up with oak trees? Because oak trees are, are lovely and very pleasant to sit under and read a book. Okay. So I put this in here to kind of underline this point. You know, we are we are making up these lines between plants and oak trees are a great example. I truly think that oak taxonomy is a bit of a con. And I have a bit of an issue with taxonomy, I think, because of do you remember my senior thesis project when I was an undergrad? Um, Jog my memory. OK, when I was in undergrad, my senior thesis was trying to quantitatively measure the difference between extractable lipids between three different species of Quercus, which is oak. How did you get lipids from an oak? For anyone that doesn't know, a lipid is a fat molecule. Basically, she means oil. Yeah, there's oils in acorns. Oh, geez. I remember collecting so many (laughs) ding-dang acorns for you. And yeah, I tasted something that you made from it, uh, oil or whatever, and it was super gross. Very nasty. It was super gross. (laughs) And I yeah. can't believe you made a, a school project out of that. I mean, I tried to. It it, it was uh, my methods left something to be desired. But you know, I was an undergrad, so I was figuring it all out. But <laughs> I had some issues starting off because I went out to go and identify my specimens that I was going to pull acorns from. So I think I was using three different species. I think I was using Quercus macrocarpa, Quercus schumardii, and Quercus, I think, stellata, if I remember correctly, which are just three different species of oak, which is Quercus. And I, like, went out to try and identify these specimens of different species. And I went back to my prof and I was like, Doc, Doc, I'm having some trouble. What 
what plant is this that I'm looking at? And I take him out to go and like look at this tree and he'd be like, oh, yeah, it's like a little bit of this one and a little bit of that. And I was like, what? He's like, well, oak trees can just cross pollinate between anything in the genus. What? Why does it even matter then? (laughs) I know. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. So so basically every time I, I would like have to pick a specimen, I would just look at something and be like, ah, close enough, I guess. I'm eyeballing it. It looks pretty close to what's described in this book. Definitely got some other stuff in there. Close enough, though. And I was oh, just boy. like, what is the point of the science? Because there's like, there's not actual li- We're imposing these lines. Pla- these plants are much more complex than our categorization system can bear. And that leads to, like, failings in the science. Like, if I was looking at a Quercus stellata that was, like, actually one quarter Quercus macrocarpa compared to, like, a 100% Quercus macrocarpa, like, that, that is going to influence the data that I get. And I don't have a way of understanding that based on our current taxonomic system. So... I mean, is that like me saying I'm one quarter Irish? I mean... Probably I don't know not. If we juice you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, what I mean is that, like, these these plants are much more complex, and I truly think that oak taxonomy is a con. And I currently have a feud between me and the park rangers at the Alamo because they do not know how to categorize their oaks, even though oak categorization is itself a con. It is proof that even the national park rangers at the Alamo cannot do it correctly because it's fake and it doesn't make any sense because they have incorrectly identified one of their oaks, and it just drives me crazy. I mean, they should just call them all Fred and be done with it. Oh, my God. And is the Alamo a national park? I thought it was a state park. I don't know. But regardless of it, they should fix it because it currently says Quercus Virginiana. But I have an issue with that. Not because Quercus Virginiana is, you know, quantitatively different than Quercus fusiformis, which is what that tree actually is, but because Quercus virginiana had not been introduced into the area when that tree was planted. And I think that because it is like a historical area they should understand the history of their botanical species but Quercus virginiana and Quercus fusiformis are practically identical so I get the confusion it makes sense but also they won't change it and I told them to change it Hallie Casey laying it down everybody <laughs> do you want to know the difference between Quercus fusiformis and Quercus virginiana because this is really no, where I don't. oak trees get not really fake. but I bet you're gonna no, tell I- me I'm going to tell you because I'm just so mad about it. So they are identical (laughs) trees, except for the fact that one of them, and I can't remember which one it is, has a pointy end on the acorn and the other one has a round end. Other than that, they are literally identical. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. That's that's even less than like the star belly sneeches. Oh my God. Exactly. Exactly. It's not even snitch level of diversity of difference of diff oh i just get very worked up about the oak trees that i get very worked up we feel your pain we yeah. don't we don't feel her pain it's gonna be okay hallie don't worry about it i have no is idea it? what she's talking about is it gonna be okay nobody cares Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. If you'd like to support the show, please rate and review us on iTunes or consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. If you'd like to connect with us, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at one to grow on pod. The show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It's produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is something elated by Broke for Free, and our show art is by Mariah Coley. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.